Uh, thanks for coming. Um, this is the this is the beginning of a conference we have tomorrow. Uh, for probably most people here are, have come to the conference as well. Uh, tomorrow and the next day, based on Game Sense, and uh, we've started this year at University of Canterbury uh, a tradition of bringing in high-profile sports coaches in what we call a sports seminar series. We had Robbie Deans earlier this year, February, March, and uh, we're really thankful to uh, have John McKee here, who's John's the coach of the Fijian Flyers, uh, who played so well at the Rugby World Cup. I think for myself, watching them play, I felt really sorry that they were in the pool of death. Um, England couldn't get through, uh, so it was a pretty hard task for, for Fiji. I think if they'd been in certainly two other pools, they would have well, they went through the knockout rounds. And uh, for me personally, not that I'm an expert, I was just really impressed with the way they played with cohesion and flair. And for me, I think John's doing a fantastic job, and I look forward to seeing them in a couple of years' time. Um, what we're going to do today is John's going to speak about game sense because that's the we certainly push that in our coaching program here um, at University of Canterbury, and that's what the conference is about as well. I'm not going to go into a lecture, because I'm not here to lecture about what game sense is, but it's certainly interpreted in different ways, in different circumstances, but just generally has a lot of things in common, such as a lot of training in games that transfers more effectively um, to the competition situation. John's going to talk about his development as a coach who and how he took up some of the ideas of game sense, which I think is really useful. Uh, he'll speak for around about 40 minutes and then following him, Steve Harvey, who's just sitting in the front row there. Steve's um, an associate professor at uh, West Virginia University. He, he's English, living in America. That's why he's got a strange accent at times when you speak to him. Probably more so because he's from Middlesbrough. Uh, up in, if anyone knows where that is in England, um, they've got a pretty distinct accent up that way. Um, Steve's a contracted player, a contracted coach with, uh, in hockey with England. Got a lot of experience and background in hockey, but he's also a leading researcher in game sense and games-based approaches around the world and someone that I've actually had the pleasure of, co of working with, collaborating with and co-publishing with as well. So when John's finished his talk, Steve will comment for five or ten minutes and then we'll open up the floor to questions. Please take this as a friendly conversation, not as a lecture. John's not being paid to lecture and nor is Steve on this occasion. He, he does back in the US. So it's more a sharing of ideas, telling their stories and please feel free to ask, comment, disagree, agree, anything at all that we get a conversation going that makes all of us here a little bit smarter and a bit better informed when we walk out the door. Okay, so please welcome John to the, to the mic. Yeah, thank you, um, Richard, for your kind words. And um, thank you to people who have come along this afternoon. Um, as, as Richard said, I'm going to talk about partly about my pathway as a coach and, and how I came to came to the, the game to understand some of the aspects of game sense and how I've applied that to to rugby coaching and also looking specifically around the um, the flying Fijians and how how I've applied some of the game sense aspects to our training and particularly in the in the build up to the to the recent World Cup. I think it's I think it's beneficial um, to to start off with to look at look at rugby, the way it's played, and and probably some thought processes about how the game has changed over time. Now, I, I was played most of my senior rugby, you know, from the late seventies and and right through the eighties, where I think a lot of the coaching was quite about the technical aspects of the game, and we and we didn't get a lot of coaching about the, probably the, the the wider game sense approach, approach to the game. It was very much the um, technical coaching in the various parts of the game, and and you know as a as a tight forward, got a lot of technical coaching around tight forward play, but but didn't get a lot of coaching around around the whole game. And I think that was how rugby coaching was quite prevalent back then. But you can see from from these sort of snapshot of statistics here, you can see how the game's changing. 
And I apologise that the statistics there are from 2011. I'm sure there's um, some new statistics to be coming out around now from the Rugby World Cup. But I don't think in the last four years there would be a lot of change. I think the, think the big change has been over the period before. So we see, we see there from the, from the numbers that ball and play is, is, is much more. So it's, it's up about a third. So at, at elite level rugby, there's a lot more ball and play and that's, players need to be fitter to, to, play, to play that sort of game, but they also need to be more skilled in a lot of aspects of the game. You see a massive change in the, in the number of rucks and malls, you know, up you know, well over 100%. And that, that, that's where the, I think the greatest difference in the game has occurred. And you go back another 10 years before that, there's been a, you know, it could be 200% change. So, you know, for coaches of, of my era, the, the game we played is very different to the game today. And, and I think what you can see from the, from the number of rucks and more, so the number of sort of probably restarts in the game in, in that unstructured area, that the game lends itself much more to, to, for players to have a greater game understanding, a greater, greater game sense. You hear coaches talking about, I want my team to play what they see in front of them. Well, how, how, do you, how do you coach your teams to, to recognise the signs or to be able to take advantage of what they, they see in front of them? And, and if you need to train, I believe you need to train that, in, or you need to incorporate that in your training to get, to get some payback in, in the way they play the game. You know, the number of passes up, up quite significantly as well, and that's a reflection of the, the, the more continuity in the game and also you know, the, the greater time that the ball is in play. You know, that probably, you know, like line-out scrums, kicks uh, uh, quite significantly reduced. Um, that's interesting that they still have a very, very important part of the game and, and we all know that the set play is very, very important in winning your primary source of ball. But I think we see from the snapshot there is that the game has changed significantly and it's a much, there, there's much more ball now from what I'd call unstructured unstructured play. There's much more unstructured play in the game now than there used to be when it was very much a set play based game. You know, for, for me in, in my coaching uh, as, as a player and in the, in the early part of my um, probably the early part of my coaching and, and, and certainly in the coaching courses I, I did earlier, very much, very much drill based rugby, very much technique based, didn't really address the, the, the game sense aspects of the game. You know, for me uh, personally, I was always think of willing to, to look outside, to look to other, other sports, to, to talk to other people about, about how they approach training. You know, really, you know, seminars like this I think are a great thing and, and you know, as I was a young coach I was always looking for these type of um, seminars and environments to attend to, to get some discussion going and it certainly helped me formulate some of my, my philosophies and ideas. In the, in the, in the mid to late 90s, um, for, for some of the people in the room here probably quite familiar with, it, uh, with Rod Thorpe and his work, he's um, an English sort of academic sports coach, I think badminton was his main sport. Um, he, he, he did a few trips out to Australia where I was living at the time and starting my coaching off and, and running some seminars on, on game sense and, and so that was my first, my first um, I guess exposure to it. I mean in, in the early days it, it was quite different to what I'd been used to in, around my own rugby career and also my early sort of coaching courses I'd attended to but I started to think about these other possibilities. Around the same time I attended the uh, National Coaching Conference in, in that year, it was held in Melbourne in 1999 and, and Wayne Smith and Dave Hadfield made a presentation which has always really stuck in my mind and it, although it wasn't specifically about game sense, it was, it was you know around the um, player centred coaching and, and really the, the query theory and the, and the open ended questions, open ended questioning of players to help them help them better understand what what they do in the game, and I guess the, those two things had quite an influence on, on my, my thinking going forward. 
In 2000, I, I moved overseas to coach and I, I was working as an assistant coach in France for, for two seasons. And, and during that time, I met um, Pierre Vaupreur on um, two occasions and had some quite interesting and, and lively discussions with him about, about coaching. He was the national coaching director at that stage for the French Rugby Federation. And what, what really um, interested me about what he was saying was almost the total reverse of the, the coaching courses I'd come from, which was about teach the skills and then the game, the how to play the game will come later almost. And, whereas he was advocating the exact opposite which from my background I couldn't see how it could work you know he was saying well if we just teach them skills they won't know how to play the game so what we should do is when players are young we should just get them playing games and just let them play games and then as they learn how to play the game then we teach them we teach them skills or we take them aside and 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 help them to be better skilled through skills training but he always would say things like you know if you teach a player to kick how does he know when to kick if you just teach a player to pass how does he know when to pass I found that very interesting and and in very French style it was um, some quite lively discussions but I think the, the the answer for me I think the answer was somewhere along that along that line it wasn't one way or the other way but it was interesting to find you need to find the balance of skills training and technique training with with game sense or, or, or game game based training for a lot I, I spent a number of years overseas as a coach and, and during that time I was mostly I was always an assistant coach so it was a little hard to to introduce things and and because it depended on the head coaches his philosophy and, and you know and I had a lot of discussions with, with head coaches who would say, Yeah, I really yeah, I'm really interested in what you're saying, John, but we're not gonna do it that way, but we're doing it this way. So really to, to put things in practice took a little while. I'd, I'd been at the Eastwood Club in Sydney in the late nineties and, and really started to do a little bit a little bit there, probably for me a little bit of experimentation. But it wasn't until, you know, the mid 2000s there, 2007 I came back to Australia and, and, and to actually be head coach of a team that I could actually start implementing some of these things and certainly the Central Coast Rays in the, in the first year or the first sort of I guess Australians attempted a national competition only lasted for one year but with, with that team we had quite a bit of success and, and really I, I used game based training for, for two reasons one was because I saw the game, a lot of the what we did in the game was very random and, and a lot of the, the, the ball that we got in the game was from unstructured situations so we needed to our players to, to understand how best to react to the unstructured game because that was actually a bigger part of the game than the, than the very structured play from lineouts and scrums. But it was also, I, I found it as a way, it was, it was a new team and bringing a lot of new players together. We had a mixture of experience and, and, and club players in that team that uh, I think the, 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 the training also had the advantage of being quite motivating for the players because it was something quite different. So the, it really helped get the players, to, I thought, to buy into, buy into what we were doing. We were actually doing something different and, and that was very motivating for the players. We had some good success with that team. And I continued with, with Ringer Rugby Club sort of following on from there and, and really w kept w sort of for, my, for myself developing my own um, game sense training I guess in, in the context of, of rugby and, 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 had, and had some good success around that with the, with the Ringer Club as well. John Evans who is um, presenting at the conference tomorrow has um, done a lot of academic work in this year and actually John had been a colleague of mine for quite a while in, in the coaching coaching era is, is actually at, at the Eastwood Club in the 90s. He was actually my fitness trainer. So during that time we were developing a few sort of game games, rugby training through games and, and also it was John that introduced me to, to the, the Rod Thorpe seminars in Sydney in the late 90s. So, so John and I sort of associated, gone back quite a while and, and by this stage John was working in, in, at Sydney University and doing a lot of research within the, the game sense coaching methodologies and, and also uh, other aspects of coaching. So I've had a very useful with John, like we, we had a lot of discussions around this, but also John 
did some coaching review of, of me coaching, which, which was very beneficial to me to see how I actually related to the players in training sessions, by filming sessions and, and recording sessions, but also through talking to the players. So, so that was that was an aside that, that was very beneficial to me, but also but, but with John we really discussed um, game sense. We take a sort of a jump to, to elite rugby coaching and say, well, what is, well, what is elite rugby coaching? Well, what, what do you need to do? And I, I think for me, you really need a, quite an underpinning game philosophy because there's going to be a lot of things in, in elite rugby coaching that are going to pull you one way or the other. And I think that for me, you really need a strong underlying philosophy which will help, will help guide you down that road because you can you can get railed roaded one way or the other and, and I think you need something to fall back on, you know, when when the pressure's on to say that, that to to I guess to see through the smoke or, or through the trees and, and, and see see the road ahead. You know, a good good technical technical knowledge of the game is very important, but I think in, in some areas of the game have got have got so technical now that that, that no Head coach can be a technical expert in, in all areas. I know, you know, at club level, coaches are, you want to have much, many support staff maybe, and, and you and you have to be across a lot of things if you're coaching at club level. But certainly at the elite level, you, you're going to be utilising and, and employing um, some very highly technical coaches in particular areas, and you know, particularly around the set play and, and things like that. That there are some very very good coaches out there and I don't think any head coach can, can hope to be across all the technical areas of the game at a, at a high enough level to, to be everything to everyone in elite rugby. Program planning and delivery is, is a m massive part of, of elite rugby coaching. I mean, you know, the, I guess the, the, the planning of the program is all important but it's not just about planning, it's about, it's about delivery as well. You've got to be able to deliver deliver the, the plan a, a, as you want to. Managing people, big part of the job is managing people, players, you have a very diverse group of players, you know, probably minimum of 30 in a squad, I think, you know, Super Rugby seems to be getting bigger and bigger every year and their squads are, uh, you know, getting up to around 36 and it could even grow from that. I mean, the, there's, there's managing Managing the, the playing group is, is, a, is a major job in itself and, and you know, with, with big squads come a lot of different needs with the players as well. You've got players who are playing all the time, players who don't play very much. Um, how, how do you get your younger players skilled enough to, to, to become starting players? There's a lot. Managing of, managing of people is massive. And, and staff, you're going to have, um, you know, coaching staff, technical coaching staff, medical staff, S and C staff. There's a lot of, a lot of staff to manage within your program as well. Managing stakeholders. You know, you've got your internal stakeholders. You, you know, your board or your or your your union. Um, other other areas of the game. You know, the community game, the the the, the rugby fans, but but also you know media and and other external stakeholders, sponsors, that that can take up um, a chunk of your a chunk of your job. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a results-driven game and you can see from the Rugby World Cup already, you know, some of the fallout around, around you know, the expectation of results and, and, and what the result is for, for coaches going forward. Now, the Flying Fijians, um, I guess I've been working with Fiji Rugby now for about two years, uh, and I've been head coach for 18 months. And, and certainly, one, one of the, one of the big attractions for me going to Fiji was, I guess, the what I thought were the, the unique sort of profile of the Polynesian and, and particularly the Fijian athletes. You know, you know, big, fast, skillful players. They, they really enjoy playing rugby. They they enjoy the the, the open the open game. Uh, you know, for for me as head coach. I want to develop a game style that suits their natural flair for playing the game, that, that suits their natural strengths, but, but we also need to, to understand that sometimes you need to not curb that, but 
to, to create a better understanding of, of being more patient in the game to, to create opportunities. So we want to we want to play with a little bit more patience, but we don't want to curb our, our or the Fijians' natural natural strengths around you know running running rugby. One of the big challenges of working with Fiji is, is, is working within short time frames to, to prepare teams for competitions. Um, the Rugby World Cup, there were um, 31 players in the squad, T two of those players were based in Fiji. All, all the other, you know, the other 29 played in, in professional competitions all around the world, mostly in Europe um, and, and a number within Super Rugby. So that, that has some interesting challenges and certainly you know, short, short time frames to prepare for competitions has some interesting, interesting challenges. Well really, given the short time frame, I think we need, we need to train very specifically to play the, the Fijian game and I, and I think, I think you know, for, for all teams can benefit benefit from this that you know you got to really identify the, the specifics of your game and then train specifically for that and, that, and that's that's where I felt that the, 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 the game style training and and you using using games to, to to reinforce the way we wanted to play the game would be would be very beneficial and I think that that helps it's motivating for the players but it's also I think I believe with the short time frames we're up against that would also help us get to get to understand our game plan much more quickly. And 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 in doing so we're creating a, le a learning environment through the training, you know, so the players are learning, they're learning on the field, they're learning through the training. Certainly, you know, a big aspect, and this is when we start to talk about game sense, is you know improving decision making. You know, earlier on, I, I talked about you know the coaches say, oh, "I want my team to play what what's in front of them." They're, they're, uh, how how do the, how how do you develop your your decision making so players can can actually see what's in front of them? They can see maybe where the space is, or where there are mismatches, or, or where there is opportunity to to break down the opposition. And certainly, you know, through games and through game sense games, you can really lim limit the time and space, and, and manipulate the opportunity. You know, you, you can you can manipulate games by by controlling the defence, by making the defence defend very tight. You know, create space on the outside, but by making the defence spread across the whole field, you know, the, then the space becomes in in the gaps in between. So. By, by manipulating the opportunity, you can help your players recognise the opportunity. You can start your games by that they know what the manipulation is, so that they know that the space is always going to be on the outside, or they know the space is always going to be through the gaps or through the, through the line. But then as, as players get better at that, you, you, you make it more random and, and, you, and you let the defensive team mix around. You might play around with the numbers, but, but but so there's different pitches thrown up to the attacking team, so they don't know whether they're going to defend tight, wide, or whatever. So th that's that's really, I think, the the crux of, of what you can do when you when you're developing and improving decision making in in the attacking team. Within within the flying Fijians, we use you know game scenario training a lot to around the the specifics of our game plan, around the way we we wanted to play the game. So. And, and really, through the World Cup campaign, mostly we we played those scenarios 15 on 15 as much as we could. With um, you know, taking into account that sometimes we had some players injured, and also that this was an important aspect for us as well around the the game specific fitness. I mean, w w one of the things, particularly with the um, Rugby World Cup campaign that we had identified, and, and we we knew this from. From previous experience and, and assemblies, that our, that our players weren't fit to play the game that we wanted to play. I mean, they, they were coming back from clubs that, that quite often play quite a different style of game, and, and particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, the expectation for players for repeat efforts was not as high as, as we'd experience in the Southern Hemisphere, or, or certainly that we required 
for our game. So, so we knew, knew our players needed to be fitter to play, to play our game. So we understood that we could do this through, through game scenarios, through playing games. And, and we use a lot of GPS, so we, we, knew, we really knew the markers that we needed to hit, the distance we needed to run, the, you know, the high speed intervals that we, that we had to and that we had to hit. And, and over the, at, I guess at the start of our program, we, we still had to do top ups because we weren't hitting those markers. But the, by the time we got close to the World Cup and got into the campaign, we pretty well knew what sort of sessions we needed for, for different aspects of fitness and, and we, could, we could run those game scenario sessions with, with minimal need for, um, for extra top up. So that, that was, it was more enjoyable for our players and it was also much more efficient because we were, we were practicing our game plan at the same time we were developing our, our fitness. And I'm sure the players found it much more beneficial and much more enjoyable and that's why they got a lot better at, at, at hitting their, their markers in terms of high intensity running so that they, they didn't have to do, do extras. Okay, our, our, um, our game plan with the Flying Fijians was actually very, very simple. We realised that the, the, the big advantage with our physical profile of speed and, and you know, big guys that can run fast was the, the more often we could get the ball to the 15 metre channel, the, the, better, the better we were going to be. You know, numbers advantage, mismatches, or even, you know, with, with the players we had, you know, for, even for a one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two with some space, we, we'd back our players to, to win, those, win, those, win those battles. Um, so this, this became a, a big part of our, our training and, and when we start talking in a minute about, about, about the game sense way of playing, this is, this, these are some of the things we really focused on. It's interesting that around you know, how, how many times, who, who carries the ball in the game. For, for, for most teams you look at it, the forwards tend to carry the ball slightly more than the backs or, or it might be 50-50. We, we certainly noticed that the games that we played really well on in our you know, history over the last couple of years are the games where the backs carried the ball more times than, than the forwards throughout the game. And, and, and sometimes even in the, the lead up to the Rugby World Cup, we were falling, for us, falling into the trap of our forwards carrying the ball too much and we're not using our backs enough. So that was, that was quite a focus for us in our training as well to, to develop our players that they could understand what was happening in the game and make sure that our, our backs carried the ball more times. And it was, you know, it was quite a subtle, subtle difference. There's not, there's not that many carries one way or the other, but you know, it might be something like if, if, you know, if, if the forwards carried 40 times and the backs 35, it wasn't a good game for us. It was just a matter of, but if you get those numbers the other way around, like if our backs were carrying 40 times and our forwards 35, our outcomes in the game would be much better. It would mean we're getting the ball to the 15 metre channel more. It would mean we're putting the, the opposition under a lot more, lot more pressure. Another massive area of the game for us was how, how to exit our own half. And this was a big focus for us throughout our, our program as well. Our players actually had a poor understanding of, of the need to exit well. You know, the, and they would actually try to run their way out of their own half probably a lot too much and we ended up playing and, and in some games although it looked very spectacular we, we, we tried to play too much from our own half and, and all that happened was that we you know, we looked fantastic and looked looked spectacular the way we played but you know in, 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 at high level rugby we, we'd get very tired and, and find it hard to finish the game out strong in the last 15 minutes so we had to be had to be smarter in getting the ball out of our own out of our own half. We could play field position game better. You know, so if, if we could kick the ball into their half and have a good kick chase, you know, we could force them to kick the ball out or, or we could we could trap them in their own half in possession or, or, or we could force an error in their half and we'd get a set play in their half in terms of a scrum, which would, would be very good. Or we could create cr counter-attack opportunities, which was actually for us a strength you know, they kick the ball back to us, then we've got a, um, an unstructured situation 
where where we could exploit. And and with the profile of our team, I think counter attack could be our point of difference. So training games to develop our game plan. So you know, as I talked about, that that we really wanted to 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 use a lot of game scenarios to develop our understanding of our game plan, but also to develop our team cohesion and, and to some extent our, our specific match fitness. Uh, we, we, develop, we develop some games to, to develop, our, develop our attack, you know, those, those simple points that we talked about, about getting the ball to the 15 metre channel. So, so we, we, we played games and, and quite often these were 15 on 15, but we, we would restrict the defence. Perhaps we, we would stop, not allow the defence to actually go into the 15 metre channel. So the, the middle of the field was very, very crowded. There was no way through, so it forced the, it forced the team to, to go wide. And then the, the defenders could only go into the wide channel when, when the ball was actually in the wide channel, but attackers could stay out there. So. That, that created situation had a massive incentive to, to, to get the ball to those channels and we found through training that the players were doing it a lot more and there's a definite transfer of that in, into, our, into our game plan. We also had some games where, where if there was a point scoring thing that you actually scored more points if you scored tries right on the, on the edge whereas sometimes you think that it's better to score tries right in the middle <coughs> but we were trying to get them to, to, to use the width and realised that, that the more times we could get the ball into the widest channel, the better off we would be. And we could either have that through a, through a game where it would be point scoring or, or giving the team extra time in possession, like if they got touched in the widest channel, they could keep the ball for more phases of play. Something else that we really utilised a lot in our, in our game scenarios or, and, or these games were you know, to, to let the opposition or the defensive team have an opportunity with the ball. And, and that also developed in the, in the attacking team, the understanding that you get, in, when you play the game, you get one chance at it. You don't get a chance in the game to go back and do something again. So although we wanted to, to play the ball wide, we also wanted to be, be patient as well. And, and to, to keep the defensive team motivated, they obviously realised that if they could get a turnover, that they could play with the ball. So. It sort of had a, had a two-way thing and, and made the attacking team be smarter in, in trying to keep the ball and, and not make mistakes, but it also gave the, the defensive team an opportunity to realise that if they, if they won a turnover, they, they could actually become the attacking team. And that's what happens in the game a lot, that, that you know, if you can win a turnover, you've got to transition from defence to, to attack and, and, and how, you, how you quickly get into, into a game shape and a game structure um, is, is beneficial as well. So we, we weren't just practicing the attacking team, Every, everyone was, was working together to, to, to get a better understanding of the way we wanted to play the game. <coughs> the, the other area that, that we played games a lot, we call it the exit game where, where one team you know, is working to ex exit their half and, and we, we had we had, we had a little game which had some rules in it where you know, if a team received the ball in their own half, they could have two touches to get it out of their half. If, if, they, could, if they had a third touch in their own half, for instance, that would be an automatic, automatic turnover. And if you got the ball into the, into the opposition's half, then you could keep the ball for four touches and, and try to score. <coughs> if, they, if they hadn't scored, that would be an automatic turnover. So then the other team would be exiting. What, what, what that did was it, it, it helped with decision making and, and how, to, how to get out of, out of your half and recognising the opportunity of what, what was in front of you. So they had a number of choices there. They could either, if they got the ball in their own half, they could just kick it directly back into the other half. That, that's one way of exiting. And you know, if, if there was space back there, we, 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 for us, we, we really encouraged for, against most teams to kick the ball long downfield and keep it in field and, and put pressure on. The team receives the ball in their own half, they can actually carry it into the, into the other, other team's half. So we were trying to encourage more, more, more direct carries to, to, to get the ball back into the directly into the half or, or, or to carry and, and, and open up better 
um, kicking opportunities. I better set up to kick back. If they had to, if you started to run the ball and they came up flat to defend, then there'd be more space behind. And so the other thing is to carry the ball directly. So rather than if we run our own half, rather than making a lot of passes behind the behind the trying to get the ball across the field where, where the opposition good kick chase is coming up, sometimes it's better just to carry directly, take as much many metres up as you as you can in your first carry, and then maybe in two carries you can get the ball into the opposition half and then and then then you would you would have, in this situation you'd have your, your four touches. So, so that, that, that they were two things that we did a lot in training, and really, it really you can see, um, if, you know, watched our games over time, and our, our, our game development and our, and our shape and the way we play the game improved markedly, markedly from the from the Pacific Nations Cup sort of through July to, to the Rugby World Cup, you know, through through late September, and and most of our improvement came through through playing games and training like this. See this clip here, you can see the way we're playing here. This is actually running out of our own half, but I think you see here how the players are really aware of trying to get the ball to the widest channels and realise that that's that's where we can that's where we can make the the best advantage. And and you know and, and things like that, I think clips like that, you see that looks very spectacular in the, in the game situation, but it but that comes through you know the natural flair for the players to play the game, but also by playing a lot of games where they play like that, where they play from side to side, that improves the skill of the passing. Looks spectacular when it when it comes off in a in a test match like this, but it's certainly it's a reflection of the way we trained. And I think by playing those games, we talked about games where where they had an incentive to get the ball to the widest channels. You can see there that that. They got the ball to the 15 metre channel on one side. They almost got it back to the 15 metre on the other side, but it, it opened up. It opened a lot, up a lot of a um, lot of opportunity and, and resulted in a very good try. Here we see. Um, here we see an example of um, counter attack on a kick receipt. And you see straight away, look, looking to looking for opportunity to get the ball wide. You know, players get back and get wide, and we realise that we got the ball into the wide, widest channel, which happens. It's going to create opportunity for us. In in this case, it's actually one of the forwards that makes the break. But you can see there by getting the ball to the to the widest channel, and and then getting into into some into, into our into our game shape that. Opportunity, opportunity comes up, and, and you know you look at once again. You look at something like that. There, it all looks very spectacular, but it's come through repetitive game scenario trainings with, with manipulating defences and, and that type of thing. So players learn learn to look for look for opportunity. see here you know quite a random training situation you see that sometimes it look, looks messy but what we're trying to achieve here this is our exit game so the players have got two touches in their own half you see a coach just kick the kick the ball in for one team to start the team that the light blue team are looking to exit their half now 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 the other team see they would carry very directly to try to get back close to the halfway. Looking to get the ball wide the 15 metre channels, using all those principles. It 
sometimes his training looks looks uh, a little bit messy, but you, you're getting a lot of transfer into, into what actually happens in the game. So see, I think the ball eventually went into touch, but you can see that the two teams working to, to exit the ball from their own half, and they're only allowed two touches each in each um, in their own half. I, 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 look, I think it's quite motivating. It's quite motivating for them. It, it makes training for them interesting, and you can see you can see in these these type of trainings that they, they actually get through a lot of work without thinking too much about it. And and we, a lot a lot of use of video as well. So the, a lot lot of lot of the the coaching came came after. Like there's minimal stoppages in the training. You're not stopping to explain things. You're not going over things, you're not losing rhythm in the training, but, but after training it could be with could be with key players or it could be with with the team the whole team or it could be with the units, could be with the backs saying look at this scenario, was it was it the best option? If it didn't come off, what could we have done better? That type of thing. But you can see in this here this you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of running, there's a lot of movement. You know, players have got to work all, all the time. It, it gets the players off the ball working as as well. It gets players getting getting themselves in, into into good positions, either either for a kick chase or or, or to get into our our shape to play. And, and definitely from this, we got great payoff in in the way we in the way we played. And I and I think this is. Some coaches argue that it takes a long time to get it by doing this. I, I, I disagree with that. I think some coaches think you need more structure to get quick, quick results. I, I disagree with that. I, I think that, you, that by by playing this and, and giving your team good, good feedback or individuals good feedback and, and good um, good training reviews, that you get a very quick transfer from the training situation to, to the game situation. A lot of the, a lot of the I think the, the, well for me, the, the, you know, what I'd call the game sense, I'm not sure it's actually the, the academic terminology of it, but for me the game sense learning and sort of as I sort of broach there and answer that question that it's 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 player centred, so it's, it's about the players, and it's, it's and it's really <coughs> about asking open-ended questions. It's not, it's not about telling telling players what to do. Players learning through thinking about thinking about what they're doing, and and the the advantage at the level I coach at that we get a lot of good quality video of training, so so you can use a lot of a lot of video feedback to the players. But, but really, you're asking, you know. Was a certain player a good option? You might ask the, the 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 playmaker, or you might ask other players in the team. Um, do you see other options? And that's the classic. I think that's the classic way of, of improving communication. One of our one of our problems was that that the players were very quiet. They wouldn't talk much. And when we were initially trying to get the ball wide, and there was there was one game early in our in our series when. Um, you know, there was opportunity in the 15 metre channels all day, and we just didn't get the ball wide enough at all. But the guys on the outside weren't relaying the information in. So by asking, asking the players, do they see, or the other players, do they see opposition? That's where you start getting that talk, talk going, and and then you say, well, if you see the op the op options, you've got to get the information in. Sometimes, sometimes what they're doing in training is the best option, but. Or what they did in the game was the best option, but it didn't come off. Well, why didn't it come off? What do we need to do to, to make it work better? And by, I guess, open-ended questions like that back to the players, you're going to get a better, 
a better understanding because because you're developing a um, um, a, th a thought process. One of the one of the good things we I thought that we were used in our, in our team meetings was that we'd get the player we'd we'd show them a few things and then just get players to to talk together about so and you, and, and, you know so in groups of three just just talk about that and then and then we'd question some people so they'd have to have it they'd have to have an answer at first they found it a bit difficult but then as as they get used to it well they know when they're in their three they've got to they've got to come up with something about what they've seen in the video and then because they might they might get asked what what they talked about and and you really got some really good feedback out of that and and really showed the players who were really thinking thinking about what they were doing and, and how they can make the game better and I think also you get you get the players expressing it in their own words which can be a lot more effective than than you know a coach telling the players what what he what he saw you you you, you still get the same answers but I think you get a better you get a better buy in from the players and certainly through playing these games and and then and in coaching in this way it, I think it, it it builds confidence with within the game within the sort of game that you want to play so it builds confidence around their decision making it it helps the 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 players confident they can make good decisions and and it, and it helps them be more confident playing under pressure certainly for your playmakers I think it it, it builds their confidence in making decisions but it also builds the confidence around the around the playmaker with the other players that they've got confidence that they're making good decisions but they're also feeding in good information around around what options they see so it there are a lot of benefits with uh, with with coaching this way and and transfer in, into your team performance so so for me I think you know, game-based training really helps the players learn to make good decisions. Not, not just not just the the, the playmakers who who, are, who are get the ball in their hands a lot, but also off the ball. And you know, rugby a lot of what happens in rugby happens off the ball. You know, it's the unseen meters almost. You know, it's it's the it's the kick chase or it's getting yourself in a position to support to support the players that eventuate. So so this type of training and the feedback you can give your players. Yeah, it helps your decision makers, but it also helps all the players get into get into better positions on the field to, to effectively react to whatever whatever situation happens in front of them. It's quite motivating for the for the players. Um, you know, I think they, they they look forward to training a lot more. They, they 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 know they're getting a lot out of it. They know it's relevant. You know, because you're playing games and running. You know, they're naturally competitive. They 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 test each other out, you know. They put pressure on each other, and um, and you also, as as we talked about before, you get some good transfer in terms of of game fitness. There's certainly a <coughs> there's certainly a good and transfer, I think, from the from the game from the training situation to to the to the game execution, and and for me that 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 was the big benefit we had, and that was one of the major reasons that our game improved so much and it was interesting um, it was interesting for me when we played the, the, the PNC series before the World Cup then we had a bit of a camp and then we went to the World Cup looking at looking at teams that played in the PNC and I saw some of them us including I know the, the Japanese team as well there was to me quite a marked improvement from the PNC to the Rugby World Cup so some of the other teams in the competition um, I didn't see that improvement. In fact, they hadn't really improved at all. So what had happened? Other teams had got better, even though they'd stayed the same. They'd actually got further behind the competition, and I think it, it probably reflected something to do with the way that the t those teams were training. That that they, that their play improved markedly from, you know, from July through to to September. And certainly, you know, players learn to, to react to, to to better decisions in in situations. You know, we, I, we, as I've, I've mentioned a couple of times, coaches talk about they want players to, to react to the situation that involves in front of them. Unless unless they train in those situations, they won't be able to to react to the situation that they, they see, or, or they won't they won't recognise the the signs. 
So you need to really create training <coughs> opportunities where, where players have to react to different situations and, and, and get good at recognising the signs and, and making, making good decisions. All right, that's, thank you. That's, so we might hand over to Stephen, have a, yeah, and then we'll do questions at the end. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, John. I can't help adding something here that when John identified the fact that Fiji had improved out of sight between the PNC and the World Cup and named Japan as well, I know Eddie Jones quite well. And uh, Eddie is a big game sense proponent. And Eddie actually told me and that when he went to Japan, and I've coached there myself and I saw this, they're technically they're fantastic. Their fitness is as good as anyone else. He's had everything except they don't play the game well. And so his work was focused on game sense. And he used the game sense with Japan. And I think their results speak volumes, as do the results that John's had with Fiji. And so the other thing I wanted to add is, as an academic, you can you run the risk of being a little bit out of touch with the reality of coaching. We have a few little touches of it, but we're sort of never deeply involved once you become a, a serious academic. And to hear John basically saying, I know we talk about questioning, that Steve and I have written some papers on questioning, and Steve's doing his, key, his keynote on the same thing. It just resonates with what we've been writing from an academic perspective, and I guess that's one of the big advantages of working in this field is, as an academic, you can still feel you've got some influence on what really happens out there and uh, you can be part of it and help it along. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, John. Um, I'll ask Steve to come up and talk for five or 10 minutes. Um, I'm sure he's got a lot to say. I won't guess what he's going to say, but uh, come up, Steve. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, you can now hear the dodgy accent that I've got. So. You've got to put up with 40 minutes of it tomorrow, so I'll uh, try and speak clearly for the video. Um, I think um, I tried to make a note of a few points. Um, John and I had a couple of chances to have coffee um, the last couple of days, but obviously listening to the presentation allows me to hear his story in a lot more detail, and I really appreciate um, I think it's a fantastic example of how someone... Um, has took the game sense movement forward and it's a real central component of uh, practice and training and something that um, you know really um, it, it, well it's it's central to what you do and you do it on a daily basis day in day out and it's something you're thinking about framing on that daily basis um, so what I felt were a couple of points that I wanted to make really were um, Game sense was a seemed to be a holistic structure for player development. Um, the, there's a lot of talk in the game sense and uh, teaching games to understand in literature about it being a holistic conception. I, th I don't think what we have is somewhat in the literature is um, these really good case studies of what John and uh, possibly Eddie Jones have, have talked about, bar a couple of papers by a few academics. But you could really see um, that you were able to get that holistic development through fitness motivation, decision making, uh, team cohesion and something that you didn't talk about here really but um, t too much but we talked about this player analysis um, thing where well, you did talk about giving video feedback um, so involving them in giving feedback on the training sessions and looking to spiral their learning uh, through that. Um, the second thing that I thought was important was um, looking at uh, developing a learning environment which would be linked to the holistic structure. Um, what we talk a lot about is um, through game sense the ability to link the mind and the body. Sometimes through technical training uh, what you actually miss is uh, it, it creates a bit of mindlessness with, uh, with players. Whereas here um, you know you could see through the videos that there was constant movement, people were pl um, having to focus all the time, there was on and off the ball movement um, and that's really important and from a sort of academic standpoint um, 
with Richard and I, when we're talking about questioning, uh, if you look at Vygotsky's notion of appropriation, I think it's, um, it's really important. So it's just a passage here. So as an example of appropriation, it's the idea that knowledge is socially constructed and that the student or the player plays an active role in its construction. And I think that really came through as part of the, the story that you had to offer today, John. So that's where um, it's really good to see the um, academic backdrop uh, is really coming through in uh, what you're doing. Um, the other thing that I felt was important was um, how John constructed games to meet the needs of the local context. Um, I think sometimes we um, I like those two slides because they're linked together really nicely. You said, okay, these were some areas we wanted to work on, and these were games that we designed to work on that. Um, the government health warning with sort of practices sometimes is we sit in the room as coaches and think, oh, that's a great game, and we go back and um, do it with our own players and wonder why it doesn't work. Um, so I think the one message was um, design games that are related to the objectives that you have with your team and the local context in uh, which you work. Um, and then there was um, the last couple of things was um, um, improving decision making through using constraints in the in the game. So thinking about how you can manipulate uh, time, space, the amount of players, um, areas the players can run into, can't go into, and then um, making that random sometimes where you can go in sometimes you can not other times I think that that was uh, that was important um, and then the other thing that was a little bit off the the chart was um, that I felt coming through particularly in the uh, first few slides was we have this um, kind of and this is be the last point I'll make we kind of have this disassociation between academics and coaches and Richard intimated um, that a little bit um, but I, I think what came through in John's story for me was um, how he had um, had a link and was looking for things, um, actively looking for things that were going on in academics that he could uh, bring into his training. Um, and it wasn't just a case of jumping to fads, but um, really thinking about how what he was learning matched his philosophy of coaching and how he wanted his team to play. So I thought that that was um, really important. So that was kind of uh, it from me. I was a bit put on the spot by Richard, so um, I'm just kidding. Um, but if obviously uh, we'll open the room out to questions, I'm sure Richard will come and So chair. like I said, please treat it like a, you're in our university lounge room. You know, we're just having a fireside chat or a conversation if you've got anything to say. Um, and if it's critical, please go ahead as well. Uh, so if you'd like to say something or ask a question, just put your hand up and I'll ask you to stand up and say who you are and where you're from and, and then ask the question. I think if we if we had a longer if we had a longer lead in time we probably would. We um, in our short time we, we want to maximise the time that we can do fifteen or fifteen. So so we did a lot of a lot of that sort of training. So some of some of the other things we did in um, in smaller games we did fitness games in in smaller smaller groups because it was easier to probably monitor what everyone was doing. Um, and, and we, we had uh, we had other games, probably more specifically for the for the for the for the backs, played in in small sided games. Yeah, where you know, four on three or, or four on four or five on five, which which not as realistic to the to the match situation, but certainly you know where you can manipulate the pressure and and you know you so you create passing under pressure. So, so we did use small sided games as well, but more in the unit. Situation, or for or to um, to de as specific fitness development. Yes, please.
Yes, um, yeah, it's very interesting working in the in the Pacific context. Uh, you know, Pacific society is quite hierarchical, so the, the you know traditionally they're very used to listening to you know the the head man or the or the ratu or or someone's always telling them what to do. Um, you know, to bring some of our sort of more Western concepts can can be quite different. So for for um, for this campaign, so since, since I've been lead, or coaching the, the flying Fijians, I, I've really tried to work on on the leadership group and and identified you know quite a group of, of strong strong leaders there. I mean, in, in terms of in terms of developing our, our game style and our game plan, I th sort of one one of the things that's really important when you're only coming together for a short time is that that you need to have a number of your people on the on the same page before you before you start. So I, I, I communicated with with the with the senior group quite a lot about what our planning was and what our game plan was, so that so that when we came together, I already had some lieutenants amongst the players who who could help spread the message. Um, but with the Rugby World Cup campaign, had had you know, a longer time, so really really looked to to develop the the senior playing group. And, and use them to drive a lot of the, the things around the team culture aspect of it. And, and um, I worked with a, a guy from New Zealand who, who you may know, come across a guy, Dave Hatfield, who, who was doing some consultancy work through World Rugby and I really tapped into him and he helped facilitate some sessions with me and with, with, the, with the senior group of players and we, we came up with you know, some cultural things for the team and, and you know some of the you know, the drivers around the around the behaviours and that type of thing. And although I worked in the background a lot, working on that with the senior players, the senior players actually delivered it to the team. So and that that worked quite well f for for me. That was quite a normal thing to do for them. That was a big that was a big change in that that team environment. It, it worked well for us in this campaign. We need to. We need to develop it further. We need to really do more work with the senior players to understand their. There's some of them were quite good in their role because it came naturally to them, or maybe they have senior positions in society. Anyway, I'm not sure of what their backgrounds are, but but for some of the other players, they weren't really sure what their role was, and and I think by helping them understand their role better, they'll be able to contribute more more going forward. But for for us, it was interesting and some feedback towards the end of the campaign and. And, and you know, I sat down with a couple of senior players, and they said it was so different to what the Fijian team was before, because before he said everything, everything used to be just done by rules, and the rules sort of got handed down, and and it didn't really work because the players never really bought into it properly. But by by going the other way, you, you, we found we got a really good good um, buy-in. I think it's worked well for us so far, but we could do more to develop it going forward. Well, certainly, yeah. The it's interesting. It's interesting going to coach in Fiji because I always know it. Ever since I've remember, since I was young, though back in the 70s, it might have even been the 60s when Fijian teams were first sort of touring, and people would always say, "Oh, Fiji, great, great team, but they're no good in the forwards, or they're no good at the set play." But I mean, it's, it's a problem for Fiji; they haven't paid enough attention in, in that area. Certainly, you know, to be competitive at international level, you need to be. Um, you need to be strong in, in, your, in your set players. I mean, the, the great thing for Fiji is we've got very athletic players. We've got we've got a lot of players, or ne well, nearly all our forwards play in overseas competitions. I mean, they, they've got a better understanding of that. But, but certainly, you know, for the scrum, we saw the scrum very good in the 
in the Rugby World Cup, but that's really been about 18 months work that finally paid off and it, it, the scrum, you know, from, I remember looking at the tour before I was involved and looking at the footage, you know, a lot of trouble with the scrum, they were getting, you know, yellow cards and turning over ball and all that type of thing. So we've really turned that around, it, but it didn't just happen on the World Cup, it was 18 months of work and it's just having, you know, working working really technically with, with the players and and individually, probably around the front row, but also the total cohesion of the of the forward pack, and, and the same with the line out. I think the uh, our line out worked quite well. I mean, our percentages were pretty good, and we won ball off the opposition. But you know, we've got very athletic players. It was a matter of developing a line out strategy that suited suited the athleticism of our players, rather than just trying to adopt someone else's line out strategy, which didn't suit didn't suit, it, suit our team. So, so that, that was the first thing. And, and probably the second thing around, around the lineouts was that although we had very good athletic players and good lineout jumpers, we didn't have any players who were in their own club are, are lineout callers. So tactically, we didn't have the, I guess, the intellectual knowledge in the, in the forward pack of actually being able to, to strategize the lineout and, and to make the correct call. So, so <clears throat> we spent quite a bit of time with the with the senior group of players and, and the jumpers, and, and you know, recognizing, even just straight out recognizing lineouts, and say, well, where's where's the weakness, and so what would you call, and, and you know, using, using, um, you know, video footage mainly to, to show that look at our opposition, and you know, this was, wasn't in the World Cup, this was you know back in July and August, so by the time we got to the World Cup, we actually had some players who, who could make, who could make good good calls, and they actually became very good lineout leaders. No, pretty much. No, it's <laughs> maybe we did without consciously. <laughs> maybe we did without consciously doing it. If you know what I mean? Because certainly, when we, I think, in, in, the, in the particular game was when we played Tonga, which was about the second game of our our campaign, where we where we realised that you know it was obvious to everyone except for the players playing the game that the space was on the outside because. Tonga play very much that pick and go game and they play very short so they also defend like that and we just didn't get the ball to the widest channels enough and then also we were looking at what was happening with the with the carries and we knew we had to get our backs so it was a bit of a combination so, so it was probably through up to that stage we hadn't really played those games so so really that was our thinking around that then how, how can we make our trainings more relevant and that's really how we came up with yeah like having incentive to get the ball into the 15 metre channels and, we, and with that naturally meant our backs were carrying more so it was probably more subconsciously than than deliberately that we that, that we evolved that way. I think to transfer the 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 the, the train to, to the result of what they actually achieve in the games. I think that for me and um, Stephen touched on this as well to, to get the players really, I guess, get their minds involved as well as their their bodies in training. If if we do too much technique and too much drill based training, that their minds their minds are not really involved enough in the process yeah they technically they get good at things but they almost forget about it in the game and so you don't get a transfer of what you do in training to the game so so what we were trying to do through playing these games was get the results of 
how we trained into to actually actually happening in the game. So if, if we needed to get the ball into the 15 metre channel more often in the games, we, we, could, we could see the transfer from what we did in training to what we actually did in the game. And for our, and especially with that game where we played where we had the exit game where we had two touches in our own half or you could get four. So their incentive was always to try to get into the, into the other half. That was that definitely paid off for us in games because because we knew there was almost a direct measure in our success or non-success in games about how well we exited our own half. Really, to to achieve, to achieve the the game strategy is really the. So, so yeah, you, you want to be good at your skills, but really to get a transfer to to play the game under pressure the way that we wanted to play, not maybe the way the opposition are trying to force us to play, so that we could actually play under the highest pressure, play our play our own game, play to, play to our strengths. Very tough area. I, I've I've talked about it, and I've had discussions with different people about it. But I've never really either had enough time or, or probably enough expertise to be able to really to, to really measure that. I think I think that's probably the next the next area that's gonna that people are going to get a lot a lot better at a lot better at doing. I mean, part of that, yeah, making making good decisions. I think I think in training you need to get a lot of. Um, you need to get a lot of movement and, and sometimes when you're trying to do too much coaching and training because it just becomes stop start, stop start, that it that it doesn't lend itself that well. I mean I know but I understand that like immediate feedback can be can be better than feedback afterwards. I mean maybe if we had a maybe if we had a bit better technology the the you know, in our situation, that, that we we could do some things. Maybe if you could get some footage to to to, to iPads. I, I think you I think you've got to also be careful and train that you don't overload the players with too much information. Because when you're playing those sort of games, I think if if they've got too many thoughts going in their heads, it, it can be confusing. But certainly on the other side, in the more technical aspects of the game, we used a lot of more probably more direct video feedback. You know, you know, it's particularly around. Around the set plays, lineouts, and um, and scrums, we, we we use quite a lot of that, where where players could could have a look at themselves, and and then go back and you know for for scrums or lineouts, so that you know they weren't making the same mistake again. They could they they could see quite clearly, you know, the picture told a much better story than someone could tell them in words. But but for that for that type of training, uh, I for me personally, I think it's better to to keep it going, keep it going, and then and give them feedback afterwards. We try to give yeah some quick feedback during during rest times. I mean, in when when we were doing when we were doing like specific fitness, we'd probably go from a from a specific fitness to to some kind of a technical aspect of of the game, so so that they would get their rest time through doing something something more low intensity. 
or yeah, you could you could use that you could use that for coaching, for coaching as well. From World Rugby, yeah. yeah. Oh, there, there'll, be, there'll probably be one if you look on the World Rugby site. You'll see they they pretty much they do quite a comprehensive review of the Rugby World Cups, and that <coughs> that's where I got that from. I'll say that the. the the one for the current World Cup will be coming out very soon, I'd imagine. I, th I think um, I think technology will become a lot more into coaching and, and into giving very quick feedback. You know, the, and I think some of the things that you know the question here about decision making and in in training. I think I think there'll be much better technology around giving feedback to decision making. So they'll be helping decision makers. Understand what to what to look for, and I think there's already been you know there's been bits of work done on you know where where do players look and you know how how, how do decision makers where where does Dan Carter look just before the ball's coming out of the the ruck or more or the scrum compared to you know an under twenties five eight and and what what what's the difference you know players like Dan Carter seem to be able to see where the space is all the time but there'll be there'll be better technology for for probably measuring that and and that will be more helpful for players who are coming up because you'll be able to so, so I, I think that's the that that's probably that's probably where the biggest differences will come we will be when we're finished here, we're just going to retire into the shilling pub for half an hour. I think we've put some nibbles on, and if you'd like a drink, you'll get it yourself. There might be another chance there to speak one-on-one -on -one with John or Steve or anyone anyone you like. Uh, but I'd like to thank you for coming along. I hope I got something out of it. Actually, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you all learned something, and that's the thing from the dialogue, working with each other, talking, having different ideas, and coming out a little bit smarter from it. So uh, thanks very much. For coming. John's talking again tomorrow as part of the conference, so it'll be half 20 minutes, um, and, and so is Steve as well. So just to finish off, thank you very much for coming, and uh, can we have a round of applause for the two presenters?